Yeah. 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 Yeah, I didn't realize that the, that the local cuts were part of the nationwide Gannett yeah. bloodlet. Yeah. Well, there's some of them working on it. No. Okay. no. I wonder if this left hand is going to actually take a look at it. Yeah. Good. Good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, Lebanon County Board of Commissioners meeting. And we'll begin, as is customary, with the observance of a moment of silence. Rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We now have public comment. Uh, first one is David Wisen from the GAP. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners, ladies and gentlemen, David Weisnick, um, giving our Back to the Gap update. Uh, getting back to the training rhythm after the holiday period, and the snows and all the other sundry things that we work through. Uh, as of 5 February for this year, and our year starts on 1 October, we've already had over 45,000 uh, troops train on the gap. Uh, in fact, next week or this week through the weekend, uh, we're going to have 2,800 uh, soldiers and airmen training on the gap. Uh, last year, as I said before, we turned out to be the busiest National Guard installation in the country. Uh, things are looking, squaring up as we start scheduling uh, units coming through the gap and the out outline months that we will meet that goal again so busy place that we have in, in Lebanon County uh, we all should be very proud that we have that there I uh, know I am a citizen of the county and, and thank the the county and our townships for their partnership as we go forward and, and run that installation um, Sally you'll be Sally's one of our neighbors, so I mention her a lot. Uh, she puts up with quite a bit of sounds that emanate from the wood, woods and wildlands around her. Uh, we will be training with mortars, uh, which is indirect fire that kind of creates a bulk of the big explosions we have in the gap. Uh, that will be on the 8th and the 9th. And then we'll follow that up with demolitions training, which is on 10 February, demolitions training usually entails blowing up a 1 to 40 pounds of explosive uh, used by combat engineers, all very critical training. I always like to remind everybody that we have the second busiest teleport in the United States Army, um, the Army Airfield, multiple, multiple flights uh, emanate out of there every day, uh, critical training to the Guard and, and the Army and, and our country. So. We appreciate everybody's patronage with that. Um, pending any of your questions, that's all we have today. Yes, ma'am. Did you ever tell us what the first place heliport is? It is Fort Rucker, Alabama, which is where the initial entry training for all pilots in the Army occurs for helicopters. Okay, and <clears throat> like they're way, way bigger than us? Yes, and, and, and as they should um, be, but it. Um, my brother lives near them down in Pensacola, Florida, and they range all through the Florida Panhandle. Okay. And that's that's a lot of air activity down there. I was but, just curious. But we have a lot of air activity yes. here at Fort Indian Gap, so Thank you. Uh, we appreciate everybody's patronage on that. We appreciate the relationship with the foster. Thank you. Thanks, sir. So thank you, ma'am. Okay, our next uh, folks, uh, Mike. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mike Schroeder of Anvil, Vice President of Lebanon, Lebanon Pipeline Awareness. Dan Pinko, President of Lebanon Pipeline Awareness. 
Good morning. And Phil Stober from Barefoot Organics and also with Lebanon Pipeline Awareness. So um, just briefly, we sent you, we emailed you this letter, three page letter. Um, this has been going on for some time now and it will continue to unfold as the, uh, but the basic story is, is that Williams Transco, the builder of the Atlantic Sunrise Pipeline, um, filed suit in Tulsa, Oklahoma, District Court against welded construction of Perrysburg, Ohio, um, and is withheld on a magnitude of like $21 million from their invoices, which in turn prompted welded to file for bankruptcy, which in turn led to a series of claims locally by local businesses against welded. Um, as you can see, there are, there are eight claims by seven different businesses. It's almost a quarter million dollars. Um, and this is on the heel, of the, 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 um, the claims period is open until the end of February, so there still might be more claims forthcoming. Um, and just by way of context, as the letter sort of outlines, back in um, 2017, Williams Transco initiated this smartphone app, uh, Steel Shop Local, and the idea was to get, get contractors and um, uh, working for, for Williams Transco to use local businesses, which was a great idea. Um, and now this is, this is what has sort of transpired over time, is by using these local businesses, these local businesses now um, are in debt um, with unpaid invoices to the tune of nearly a quarter million dollars. So um, it's sort of outlined all there. Um, do you have any questions? Were well, the commissioners aware of this, of this uh, bankruptcy and this sort of ripple effect locally for local businesses? I have a, had a conversation maybe a month ago, I, I can't remember the exact timeline, with a local farmer to the tune of $40,000 they're owed for straw. Um, and I understand there are many other farmers in similar situations. Would they be able to enjoin in this lawsuit to recover their losses? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I don't it know. I, be, I doubt it would have to be the same uh, it, it, vendor. Unless, <coughs> same well, unless welded is, 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 is their vendor. Yeah. Um, who, who are they? Who did they sell it to? Who did they? Who was the um, You know, you'd have to talk to Bonnie Winger. I yeah. don't remember exactly who the company was that uh, she right. was delivering to. And, and from what I recall of the conversation, they were told, well, you have to continue to deliver your product, otherwise you won't get paid for future um, product. So, so I guess what, you know, what this suggested to me and to us, I suspect, is that this, this is just the tip of the iceberg that the promise was for local businesses, this will be a, a boom to the local economy, injecting money, jobs, et cetera, and now we see the reality that this is, again, this is just the public filings that we were able to uncover. You've been able to uncover more. There's probably more lost revenue by local businesses, farmers, et cetera, that, that has yet to be toted up. So, so we don't know what the overall impact, economic impact of Lebanon County is, but it seems like, you know, um, we don't know whether the, the negatives and all the <coughs> unpaid bills and invoices outweigh the amount of money that has actually come in from contractors. So this may well have been a net loss for the county. We don't know. So you don't have a feel for what percentage of the picture this is? No. This is one company um, and one group of debtors, and it's a quarter of a million dollars. Right, right. And, and, that's, and that's not everybody. We just kind of highlighted the ones that are, there's a couple, there's $500 here, there's $750 here. So for an individual like myself, 750 bucks would be a big deal. For someone who's owed $20,000, you know, maybe they can absorb that. But there's a lot in that that you look at the size of the company. Oh, I did. I saw that. <clears throat> well, to, to speak to your question, uh, again, I'm not an attorney and not familiar with bankruptcy, right. but there is a February 28th deadline. I think you double checked that right. in the paperwork. So they would still So the claims time. need to be filed. So I think it would be good if the, uh, somehow the word was put out about this. Maybe commissioners could look into this and get some sort of announcement. Well, I see we have a local um, radio reporter there, so they'll certainly help to get the <coughs> word out. And if we can get, you know, the papers on board, so then anyone who is owed money, maybe they'll get 50 cents on a dollar, but that's better than nothing. And then, and then sort of wrapping up, and I'll turn it over to Ann briefly, um, that there is, is the, the concluding paragraph um, described the, uh, because welded went bankrupt and stopped doing the work, there remains a lot of reconstruction work undone here in Lebanon County at the Snitch Creek Crossing, at the Spatara Creek Crossing, 
and other places as well. So um, let's turn it over to yeah, because um, unfortunately for us, Weldon did both the Mariner East and the Atlantic Sunrise, so they are responsible for the two projects in our county. So it's sort of a double hit. Um, so some of these losses are, are from you know, either one of those projects. And, and just to, to, to go back to your question, since that window is still open to file claims, we don't know what else is going to come in. Uh, some others came in since we first looked into this, so there could be more that are going to be filed. So we don't know the final until we have but as for the restoration work, now, um, I have been in touch with Carl at the Conservation District. Uh, there was a problem which we noted in the one area that just was sitting there untouched for only over a month. Um, and I have alerted him to, him to that, and it was supposed to be fixed as of yesterday. So hopefully that was taken care of. We do realize that some of the restoration work has to wait for better weather if uh, winter came. But it is supposed to be stabilized, so that straw you're talking about is supposed to be over areas that aren't seeded and that sort of thing. But our concerns, as they were all along, in which we helped to try and address with our own monitoring project, is we just don't feel that the conservation district was in a position to be able to properly monitor this. Um, and I don't think it's because they aren't doing their work. There aren't enough people to do the work. It, it, comes across the board from DEP, who we understand has one person to respond to emergency calls um, for our whole region, which I think is 13 or 14 counties. So when I would call them, they'd say, we don't have anybody, but we'll refer it to your conservation district, which also, I think Carl is the only person that goes out, and I understand he was, um, is he still the acting director? Um, no. Uh, okay. No. But for a time, he was. He is, so he is uh, I appreciate second. He's actually co-director with Katie Dempster. Okay, but at a time he was acting alone, and I appreciate that he just could not get that out. Was, that was years projects. ago. That um, was years ago. We've had we've had a director in place for many years now. I thought somebody left recently, within the last year. They did, but we had an immediate hire. Oh, all right, okay. At any rate, it's different than a construction site where you have a, a site that's just there and when you go it's, it's you know it's that same site that you can keep checking on the pipeline has several crews working across 20 plus miles of the county it's impossible for one person to, to be responsible to watch for that and consequently a lot of the things we discovered fell through the cracks a lot of the things we couldn't note because they were on private land that we didn't have access to, which the conservation district did. So we just felt that was a real loss to the county. We know there was a lot of environmental damage. We certainly heard from people who had a lot of complaints, uh, who spent months and years uh, disputing with the companies to get things fixed. And some did, some didn't. Um, so this has just been a real problem. Um, and it's just something I really think we need to think about with this sort of project coming in and maybe try to address head on before anything like this happens again. But we'd certainly like to see this work finished up. And uh, Carl did give me the name of the new group that's come in to the new contractor. So we do have that. So there's a new contract and they hopefully we'll get things taken care of. Well, uh, not to be difficult, but just for my own satisfaction, what would you have us do to prevent the situation that occurred with these bankruptcies? Because when you're, when you uh, extend credit to an out-of-state company, you you accept the responsibility that you know you may not get paid that with the bankruptcy laws the way they are today. Uh, I, I mean, I was in the hardware business and I saw Jono. They're a wonderful hardware store. But I don't quite understand the logic of extending thousands of dollars of credit to a company from outside uh, the state well, for it, hardware items. It, it could well be that the endorsement given by the level of the, the strong and, and, and you know, um, really very strong endorsement given by the Lebanon County Chamber of Commerce may well have, have you know, persuade as local businesses, this is this is reliable, we can trust these people, the Chamber of Commerce is behind it. Um, you know, if I were a business owner and I saw the Chamber of Commerce touting the virtues of this app that, that you know, buying local, I would think that this was all on the up and up and there's, you know, that what are the odds they're going to go bankrupt? So, you know, I think the endorsement, the public and, and you know, strong endorsement that, in, that is included on the, on the Williams website Maybe will may well be one reason why you know local businesses trusted Weldon 
to you know run up stats of fifty thousand dollars at a local hardware store. So you know, I think you know with the credit cards uh, processes that are available today, it would be just as easy for these vendors to say, you know, we'll gladly do business with you. We want your business, but it, it, the cost has to be covered now as we sell you the items. So, so in other words, it's the business's fault. No, I, I'm saying that <laughs> it, it's not. I'm not putting blame on anyone. I'm just saying that you have to recognize when you do business like this, you're vulnerable. I mean, I've, I've had people go bankrupt against my company, many of them over the years. It, it, it's a factor of business. It's not pleasant. It's not anything that, that we should endure, but, but we all do I at think one what, time or another. I think what we're trying to do, Commissioner Ames, is um, um, focus on the 50,000 foot level. Um, before these came in, and, and I have a letter that I wrote four years ago that I'm going to read probably the first five paragraphs from if you'll bear with me. And I think it's that's the kind of the context of, of how we want decisions made um, by our leaders um, in the future. So, if I may. So this is a letter I wrote in March in 2015. As Earth Day approaches, and the title is How Do You Put a Price on the Priceless? And it was in the London Daily News. As Earth Day approaches, the discussions continue about the wonderful economic impacts projects like the Atlantic Sunrise Pipeline construction will have on the economy of Pennsylvania. The enthusiastic arguments of Dennis Heller notwithstanding, to wit, the countless jobs and the millions of dollars to be pumped into our economy ignores the real costs associated with those countless jobs and all that income. The oil and gas companies and their cheerleaders always tout the economic benefits of these projects since economic success is ultimately the only measure by which these companies and their shareholders evaluate success. Social and environmental responsibility and any thoughts of the costs associated with these projects are greatly underestimated or even ignored altogether. What about resource conservation, sustainability, and pollution prevention? As a starting point, I'm highly dubious of the number of permanent jobs and the real economic impact of these pipelines when you compare the magnitude of the environmental and societal repercussions these projects will have on our region. The jobs associated have been grossly overestimated, and they are not permanent jobs. For instance, it was publicly stated by the CEO of TransCanada that after the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline running from Canada south to the U.S., only 50 people will be needed to operate it. Similarly, in a recent article by Adam France in the Lebanon Daily News, critiquing a Penn State study on the economic impacts of the Williams Atlantic Natural Sunlight Gas Pipeline, it was reported the study stated the ongoing operations of the pipeline following construction could create 29 jobs. Thus, the number of permanent jobs are admittedly insignificant, according to people responsible for the operations of these pipelines. In 40 to 50 years, when all the oil and gas is extracted from the ground, and Pennsylvania has to contend with thousands of derelict wellheads, tens of thousands of miles of empty, rotting pipelines, and the last vestiges of once virgin forest and farmland, what economic benefit will be realized then? How do you put a price on the priceless? How will it ever be restored, and who will pay for that? So I go on and talk about a few more things, but that's the point: is that you know all these all these jobs that were going to be created. There was no talk about guys going to be out for money going forward. I used to see the guys over by my farm. There'd be 16, 17 trucks, 10 of them from out of state. So. It's the, all this rosy scenario that's painted for us all before these pipelines come through, and we're all left cleaning up the mess. And so all we're asking for is to take a 50,000-foot look at it in the future, because there's going to be somebody else is going to come through. There's going to be more pipelines that they're going to want to put through here, and we're going to ask you guys to really think about it. Do we really need them, and what do they really cost? Thank you. I think that um, maybe one thing we could do is revisit with our local planning department a model ordinance um, available to the local municipalities. Um, I think I remember proposing that quite some time ago, which would help guide uh, the process. Because we can't stop them necessarily from doing it, but we can certainly in advance have uh, what's expected <coughs> of them as coming into our backyards and our homes, basically, and our businesses, and, and 
being guests while they're here. I, I think we also have to, <laughs> the paradigm shift that we have to make, that we say we can't stop them. When we've been told, scientists are telling us that if we don't stop this in 12 years, it's all over. So it's not like, like we, we put a man on the moon when John Kennedy said we're going to put a man on the moon in a decade, we did. It's not like Americans can't do it. So that's all. That's that's what we, we need to think of this more on a societal mm -hmm. level. Is how do we we have a we have a huge problem. I've seen it here locally. You talk to any farmer, you look at any field in this area. I only got one cutting of hay off this year. And we're seeing insects arrive that A were never in this area before and now they're arriving much sooner. And so anybody that's in this field, literally and figuratively, understands we have a huge problem. And to just say there's nothing we can do about it is just rolling over and saying, yeah, we're done. So I don't have any kids, but if I did, I'd feel really, really bad about what I was leaving. And that's how I think we all have to think about this together as a society. And we have to do something that, that stops this. <clears throat> if I could, I'd like to jump back just to sort of comment on top of what Mike said with the endorsements and things, um, and then I have a question. Um, a lot of money was accepted from the industry for various uh, sponsorships and things like that, and so when their name is on the county fair and things like that, um, I know a lot of events, we know that Sunoco gave money to the Land Preservation Fund. Uh, when that money is accepted, that sort of also, I think, implies that this is a credible company uh, that, that we're dealing with. And I just think we would ask that you would be a little more questioning. Um, we were at that luncheon where they presented the app, and there were no questions really raised about any of that. Nobody was asked. And it occurred to me, and I don't know if there's any kind of legality to this, but I know how townships have to, they get bonds uh, in place for road damage that's covered. Is there any kind of thing that the county can do for economic damages? or losses or things like that that could be required of a pipeline company coming in? I don't, I really have no idea if that's possible, but maybe some sort of thing like that that would show them that we're serious, that we expect you, you know, I realize nobody, well, we did not expect to go bankrupt, but this was caused by Williams. Um, so I guess my question to you too is, have you had any contact with either Williams or Sonoco lately about anything with the pipeline? And, um, so, so nothing, because they're still, uh, the Mariner project is not finished yet, so that still will be working in the, in the county for a while. Um, so you have not had any contact. And, and I guess as we ask, we would hope that you would concerning this problem. So I heard three recommendations looking the bonds, and of course, if you remember the model ordinance and accepting dollars from the company. And, and, then, and then third, we recommend, or we suggest respectfully in the letter, um, to that, that the commissioners read a strongly worded letter to our federal um, and state representatives expressing your dismay at the state of affairs for Lebanon County local businesses. Um, and um, I don't know quite what else is in your authority to do, but at least to you know, resolve that this is not a, a desirable state of affairs, that it's a deplorable state of affairs for, for our local businesses. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank Oh, same signs, so order. This is Nguyen. Good morning. Good morning. We have receipts February the 5th, February the 6th, of $1,505,443. Brings us to a total cash of $2,377,041.91. Our expenditures this week were $2,303,552.71. Our undistributed tax claim is $65,000.58. So we have a balance of, not such a big number today, $8,488.56. Let me take a motion to approve. 
move to approve the treasurer's report. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve Mrs. Newman's report as presented. Any comment or question? Uh, comment, I guess a question for Sally. To date, you've, you've had to transfer how much? Yes, just to... I, I used about uh, a million six okay. from our reserve. Might be a little more than that because I think when I was off, some of that might have been moved when I wasn't here. So okay. I just have to bring that up to date. Then. I just haven't on, had time to. On track for previous years and what we here in the first seven months. <clears throat> Only difference being we're using our own money. Yes. We're not paying exactly. interest. That's, yes. that's the big difference. We used to yes. borrow for this time. Yes. Thank you, Sally. Uh -huh. Second, any questions or comment? Hearing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, so moved. Under FMLA and leaves of absence, <coughs> Robin Booker from Children and Youth, 11 days of intermittent FMLA, effective January 7th. Susan Douglas from MHIDEI, two weeks of FMLA, returning January 8th. Jennifer Vasquez, clerk of courts, six months of intermittent FMLA, effective January 8th. Valerie Anderson from the prison, six weeks of FMLA, returned on December 26, 2018. Robert Meese from the planning department, 10 weeks of FMLA, returned January 22nd. Huggins Jane Ali from domestic relations, returned January 7th. Cassidy Kleinfelder from Pathometary's office, seven days of FMLA, returned January 3rd, or excuse me, effective January 22nd, returned January 31st. Don Policio from the treasurer's office, 12 weeks of FMLA, effective January 28th. And Beth Hope from the District Attorney's Office, 10 weeks of FMLA, effective February 5th. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept those uh, leaves of absence. Any comment or question? Hearing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, so ordered. Under changes of status, transfers, and promotions, I have a motion to approve the Director of Probation Services, Sally Berry, and President Judge Towalk's recommendation for three probation services employees. Brenda Santiago, Jody Little, and Susan Putt in the Collections and Disbursement Unit to work up to an additional 2.5 hours per week, not to exceed 40 hours per week at their hourly rate, effective immediately until the vacant Collections Officer position is filled. Second motion, motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second on the floor to accept uh, the recommendation from Sally Berry and Judge Tilwalk. Any question or comment? Hearing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All the same signs, so moved. Amanda Schweitzer, promotion from image clerk in domestic relations to team clerk in domestic relations at the rate of $922.77 by weekly, effective February 11th. Joseph Seeger, promotion from IT technici technician and information technology services department to network technician at the rate of $1,864.54 by weekly, effective February 11th. Thomas Moyer, change of status from operations specialist in the information technology services department to IT technician, no change in his rate, effective February 11th. Jessica Smith, change of status from casual part-time correctional officer at the prison to full-time correctional officer at the prison, at the rate of $16.44 per hour, effective February 10th. Samantha Wilson, change of status from casual part-time correctional officer at the prison to full-time correctional officer at the prison, at the rate of $16.44 per hour, effective February 10th. Michael Ott, promotion from captain at the prison to deputy warden of operations at the prison at the rate of $2,653.63 bi-weekly, effective February 11th. 
and Melissa her promotion from Administrative Officer 2 at MHIDEI to Deputy Administrator at MHIDEI at the rate of $2,349.64 by weekly effective March 11th. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve those placements. Any question or comment? Hearing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, so moved. Under other transactions, Area Agency on Aging would like to hire Stephanie Hafez as the Volunteer Resource Coordinator at the rate of $1,123.89 by weekly effective February 25th. Community Action Partnerships would like to hire Selena Pinero as a full-time part, excuse me, a part-time receptionist at the rate of $10.43 per hour effective February 11th. Domestic Relations would like to hire Eden Rittle as a docket specialist at the rate of $841.57 by weekly effective February 11th. Domestic Relations would also like to hire Jalisa Johnson as a customer service clerk at the rate of $841.57 by weekly effective February 11th. MHIDEI would like to hire Jose Manuel Jr. as a caseworker one at the rate of $1,179.45 by weekly effective February 11th. The prison would like to hire Angelo DiPaolo as a full-time LPN at the rate of $20 per hour with a 55 cent shift differential effective February 10th. President Judge Tilwock would like to hire Alexander Rohr as a juvenile probation services or probation officer, excuse me, at the rate of $1,581 by weekly effective February 11th. Auditory's office would like to rehire Michael Wayman as a part-time court clerk at the rate of $12.21 per hour effective February 11th. Renova would like to hire Luz Marquez Diebold as a part-time developmental assistant at the rate of $11.56 per hour with a 45 cent shift differential February 11th. The sheriff's office would like to hire Dylan Mohring as a casual part-time deputy sheriff at the rate of $12.97 per hour effective February 11th. And the sheriff's office would like to hire Joseph Vadilago as a full-time deputy sheriff at the rate of $1,117.72 by weekly effective February 4th. Make a motion to approve the hiring, says the president. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comment or question? Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, so moved. Moving on to salary board, motion to approve all transactions previously read plus the following. Edward Van Dusen, longevity payment corporal at the prison, one-time payment of $2,500 effective February 14th. Santos Varela, Jr., longevity payment full-time correctional officer at the prison, one-time payment of $3,250 effective February 28th. And Cheyenne Gettle, longevity payment full-time correctional officer at the prison, one-time payment of $500 effective February 28th. Second. Second. Motion and a second to approve those additional requests. Any comment or question? Hearing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, so moved. Their mandated conference seminars, Janet Ross and Christine Harris from Area Agency on Aging would like to attend the Protective Services Risk Assessment in Lancaster, May 16th, with mileage and meals reimbursement mandated by Protective Services. This meets the annual required training. Joe Morales, Carl Wensler, and John Wilson from DES would like to attend the FEMA Central Area in-service training in Camp Hill, February 6th and 7th, mileage and meals reimbursement mandated by FEMA. Pierre Hess from the District Attorney's Office would like to attend the Spring Prosecutors Conference in King of Prussia, March 19th and 20th, $350 total registration fee with lodging, meals, parking, schools reimbursement, 10 credits mandated by the PACLE Board. Karen Hess from Domestic Relations would like to attend the 34th Spring DRS Directors Meeting in State College, April 22nd through April 24th, lodging, mileage, meals, parking, reimbursement mandated by DHS and BCSE. Danielle Gray from MHIDEI would like to attend the following two trainings, Kindergarten Transition Conference in Mechanicsburg, February 21st, $15 total registration fee with mileage reimbursement mandated by Oakdale, and the 2019 Oakdale Shared Leadership Conference in Pocono Manor, April 3rd and 4th, lodging, mileage, meals, tolls reimbursement mandated by Oakdale. Julie Shaney, David Simonides, and Michelle Klosnott from Planning Office would like to attend the following two trainings, 
all about at grade absorption areas in Mannheim. March 1st, $330 total registration fee. Mileage and meals reimbursement, six credits mandated by CEO certification. And watertight tank installation in Mannheim, April 15th, $330 total registration fee. Mileage and meals reimbursement, six credits mandated by SEO certification. Janet Wolf and Brittany Koenig from Probation Services would like to attend Developing Your Emotional Intelligence in Harrisburg, March 21st. $298 total registration fee, meals reimbursement, six credits mandated by PBDP. Susan Christner from Probation Services would like to attend ATTAC Officer Training in Hershey, April 9th, meals reimbursement, four credits mandated by PA, uh, the PSA Police. Samantha Chesney and Carissa Cantrell from Probation Services would like to attend the Officer Survival Mindset Cover and Concealment Training in Lebanon, April 29th, eight credits mandated by PBPP and the Firearms Education Training Commission. Susan Christner and Dwight Penberth from Probation Services would like to attend the PA Chiefs Juvenile Probation Officers Membership Meeting in State College, March 14th and 15th, lodging and meals reimbursement, five credits mandated by JCJC and the PA Chiefs Council. Matthew Klein and Dwight Penberth from Probation Services would like to attend the PA Games Conference in State College, May 7th through the 9th, $240 total registration fee with lodging and meals reimbursement mandated by JCJC. I'd like to make a motion to approve all the mandated conferences. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any comment or question? I have a, just a question um, for the mandated. Do they provide documentation that these things are mandated or how is it? Um, Only because they do, you know, um, give additional documents showing what it is, but no, they just mark on it that it is mandated on the. Okay, even if there's no credits um, for continuing yet or anything like that. I'm just curious, you know, how they define mandated. It seems maybe it's a little loose. I can check into it. No, just curious. Okay. Anything else? All in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Of course, same sign, so moved. And under requested, I have Carol Davies and Ann Devine from Area Agency on Aging would like to attend a P4A and PDA quarterly meeting in State College March 13th. $220 total registration fees, no other reimbursement. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to uh, accept the Area Agency on Aging request. Any comment or question? Hearing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, so moved. Shannon McMahon, McMinn from Area Agency on Aging would like to attend the Food Safety Certification in Lebanon, February 15th and the 22nd. $185 total registration fee, no other reimbursement. Move to approve. Second. A motion to second to approve the uh, AAA request. Any questions? Not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. So moved. Michelle Idris, Leanne Shank, and Stephanie Knoll from Human Resources would like to attend a Benecon Health Benefits Seminar in Lancaster, March 7th and 8th, $225 total registration fee with mileage and parking reimbursement. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions? Not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. So ordered. Nicole Snyder from MHIDEI would like to attend a pain management training in Camp Hill, March 22nd. No other reimbursement. So second. Motion and a second to accept the MHIDEI request. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. So moved. Jocelyn Stakem from MHIDEI would like to attend the Forensic Competency Training in Harrisburg, February 4th. No other reimbursement. Second. Second. Motion and a second on the floor. Any questions or comments? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. So moved. Ken Briggs from MHIDEI would like to attend the Celebrating Social Work in Harrisburg, March 13th and the 20th, $165 total registration fee with mileage and tolls reimbursement. Move to approve. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve that request. Any questions? Not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Okay. Aye. Aye. Both same sign, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have a question. Uh, it, not all this, I was going to ask if I could go back to the previous presentation. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we do uh, through Jamie 
formulating the letter that goes to our representatives and also carbon copied as a press release so that um, the public knows that we are doing everything we possibly can to support our local businesses and that specific message about the Yes, yes. Do we actually need to adopt a motion to have something uh, begun like that? I mean, I, I, when I vote on something, I'd like to vote on something that's already been established. Does that make sense? I'd like to see the, the document. Do we have to vote? to have someone work on a, a letter. Well, I, I would rather see it and then adopt it. Yeah. From there. So yeah. I have no objection to doing it, but I, I, I would like to see what you come up with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Does that make sense? It certainly does. Uh, I mean, it's, we can I, vote. I think when we sign, that is our approval of that letter, if we have a motion on the floor to, to go ahead with the letter and, and develop it. I just think that the public needs to know that we aren't dragging our feet and that we're addressing this fourth, fourth rate. So we're not questioning whether we should do a letter. We're just saying when should we do the motion. James, do you have an opinion on that? <laughs> um, if you if you do a motion and, and detail what what you want in the letter, it doesn't suffice. Um, do a letter pending, you can authorize a letter pending your review. Uh, I, don't know, you can, I, I think it's really up to you. Uh, well, how do you want to go about it today? Otherwise, I mean, if you don't today and you want to see it and then authorize it, that'll be, uh, that'll be the 21st of February. My position would be let's get something on the record that says we're going to do proactively uh, under awareness for our legislators and you know, whoever else they requested to be aware of it. Um, just so that people on the record say we are in the process of doing that and addressing that request. So that would be my feel about it. Well, then I need clarification on the motion. The motion, on is, the motion is to have Jamie pen a letter on our behalf and with our input because we'll be reviewing it until we're all in agreement that it's proper and then we could sign off on it afterwards concerning uh, the presentation we saw on the pipelines in support of our local businesses and farmers who are at a loss for financially because of the lawsuit. Well, the farmers, I, I, I think you're going, you're talking about the straw. They, they're not welded, uh, as much as far as I know, they're not part of the welded issue. Welded would bankrupt, but that, that's another matter. I'm just, I, I thought the scope would be the folks that are subject to the uh, losses from the well they're going bankrupt. Well, um, perhaps I could reword it to uh, address this on behalf of the businesses already announced and those who, anyone else who may also join that lawsuit in the future. It could be farmers, it could be other businesses. Well, uh, from Lebanon County. Yeah. Well, uh, if you're linking it to that lawsuit, then you, 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 essentially then you're exempting folks that might come forward and, and do not, are not uh, obligated by the Welded Corporation. So I don't know if you want to be that specific. I think the, 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 the folks from Pipeline Awareness pretty much spell out what what uh, what they're looking for as far as uh, vendors uh, that have been damaged. But they repeated several times that there are probably others that may come forward because of the fact that they can still file till the end of February. So they'll say, I think what they will say is that we shouldn't be limiting the scope of it. Yeah, exactly. May I, may I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. and maybe maybe hold off on action today. I'll draft something, bring it to the 21st meeting. And you can parse it. And, and when is the deadline? I think it's going to be too late. It's too late. 
November 28th. The, the whole point is to give our to get this out to the public, so if they're impacted, they know it's up you know, out there. This was this was to make our legislators aware that we have a problem with this. The public part of it was going to be hopefully on the radio because it's today and tomorrow is the, the deadline. My understanding is, I mean, this letter to be drafted and sent out um, is not going to. It requires the media to get that out. I'll, I'll, I'll second the motion to have the letter drafted. I, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, to put this off for, for two weeks, so, so I'll second it. Thank you. We've been seconded that we uh, draft a letter that will be um, presented to our legislators of making them aware of the issues uh, discussed, subject to our uh, review and approval. Uh, any further discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, so moved. Okay. I think it's important to note that a, a bankruptcy court is not going to be uh, moved by a letter that the Glendon County Commissioner has written out. So moved. All right. Let's see what. Mr. Dowd has for us today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You're not hard. Tried really hard. I'm here today to ask that the commissioners enter into a professional services agreement with MCM Consulting. And this particular agreement is to manage the project with the joint federal income system between other and other county. Uh, funding for this agreement is part of the grant application that we applied for. Recap that grant. Uh, it's a $2.6 million grant that includes uh, new 9 phone system, the connectivity between here and North County, Texas 9 uh, and a GIS layer on top of that for accurate cat dispatch. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. On page, I guess it would be three, no, probably five of this contract, the last page. It says that Lebanon and York counties are going to be splitting the cost 50% each. It's the distribution of, of work is 50 50. Um, the costs associated with this 50 50 split. However, we are fiduciary for the entire grant, so we're paying the entire bill. But it's all grant funded. York County's money is passing through us as well. Yes. Okay, but are, are we being charged 50% of the total cost? You know, getting the grant. Out of the grants. Yes. yes, but we're managing the entire grant. Okay. Would we be eligible for additional funding had we, if we did not pay 50%? No. This the, the project, the grant funding was very specific. It included $144,000 of consulting fees for the grant project okay. altogether. So it doesn't, it doesn't change anything. All right. I just, because there's a three to one ratio in population in York mm -hmm. County, and that's why I wondered if we should be revising the percentage. But it, no. Yeah, it's no money out of either of the county's pockets. Okay. All right, thank you. And it doesn't hurt amounts we're applying for in the future. So I'll make a motion to adopt the one. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the proposal as presented. Any comment or questions? If not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those same signs, so moved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Robert. Thank you. process has been that um, we originally contracted with uh, the Commonwealth for Health Choices as five counties individually with the state 
each, and then one contract with the capital to repay it for health care for two hundred dollars. Um, we initially wanted to do um, a contract between the state and CBHC. Uh, they, the state folks, didn't want us to do that, but now they're encouraging us to do that. So a while back, we started the process of going in that direction, where we would have a single contract uh, with the Commonwealth. Uh, and CABHC, and then the, four, the five counties would have their agreement among themselves, and we would also then contract, individually contract with CABHC. So we're coming to the tail end of that process. Uh, back on uh, on uh, February, or uh, I'm looking for the date here, uh, on January 17th, uh, the commissioners agreed to move forward in that direction and, and approve and sign an ordinance and then Mr. Warner had to advertise the ordinance. Uh, so we're coming up on the end of that. So at this point, we have uh, two agreements that we would like to present to you. One of them would be the uh, intergovernmental cooperative agreement. That would be uh, the agreement among the five counties to work together in the Health Choices Program. And then we have one uh, between Leviton County and the Capital Area Behavioral Health Collaborative to, that, so CABHC can manage the program and the funds on their behalf. So you need two separate motions. That's correct. Let me let me jump in there and make a correction. The, the ordinance wasn't actually approved yet. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was proposed at the last meeting on the 17th. Uh, it was advertised then on January 22nd following that meeting, which was which was at least seven days prior to action, but within 60 days. Um, can't go further than 60 days out, so we're well within that window. So the first thing would be to actually adopt the ordinance. Okay as advertised, and then we'll go to these agreements. Thank you. I make a motion to adopt Ordinance 58. I'll second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions? Are we okay with uh, David? Yep. So, yep. He, he drafted it. Okay. So in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. So moved. Thank you. There you go. Now, um, this would be the Intergovernmental Cooperative Agreement uh, be, uh, among Lebanon County and uh, Cumberland, Dolphin, uh, Perry, and Lancaster counties, uh, so that we can work together on health choices. I'll make a motion to adopt the intergovernmental agreement. Second. Motion and a second to uh, approve that cooperative agreement. Any questions or comment? If not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Both same signs, so moved. Thank you. May we have one more report? How about the, how are the Cedar Crest girls doing? <laughs> Now you can tell us. They're, they're going very well. Aren't you going to the well. mm -hmm. section champions? Again. We play Saturday night against the winner of tonight's game between Lancaster and Fenway. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm so excited. Your first yeah. Yeah. First yeah. Yeah. First. Yeah. My priority now. <laughs> <laughs> they should be. Go ahead, Kevin. This is not as exciting, but we do have an administrative agreement between the County of Lebanon and the Capital Area Behavioral Health Collaborative to finalize the whole process of transitioning to what we call the single contract. I so move. I'll second. A motion to second to approve that. Motion, any questions? Oh, no. Sorry. Any comments? Going once. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, so move. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you, gentlemen. It. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks. certification of the um, the county's maintenance of effort uh, for uh, HAVA, uh, basically letting the state know in the period between January 1st, 2018 and December 31st, 2018 that we 
uh, spent the minimum amount that was required for the HAVO agreement that we uh, are in at this moment for the previous voting system purchase, and I will give that to you, sir, if you don't mind giving the signature, and that will be something that you will need. Speak a motion to approve the HAVA. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions, comments? Are we now all in favor? Please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. So moved. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, the uh, Board of Elections will come to order to uh, address additional issues. Okay. Uh, so the first board issue that I have would be to ask uh, permission and approval for the certification of the 2019 political parties, uh, and that would be the Democratic and Republican Party, and I have that also for you. Okay. Don't mind any signatures for me, and I approve for that. Also move to certify Democrat and Republican parties within Lebanon County. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second to adopt or to approve the two political parties as listed. Is there any discussion or comments? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> all. Okay, the last order of business would be for the, uh, my recommendation for the new election system uh, that was mandated to have a paper-based voting system in place uh, for under contract by the end of uh, 2019. Uh, I am recommending that we uh, select the vendor um, uh, ESNS, and the system that I am recommending would be what I consider a hybrid system. Uh, and to explain that, that basically means it would be a pre-printed paper ballot system uh, where we would have the voter have an, an option or choice at the at the precinct to either have a paper ballot uh, But we'd also would have the ability for them to also vote with a ballot marking device if they so choose uh, I have outlined and I've given you uh, all a handout of how that hybrid system would set up um, If you want me to go through it specifically I can um, Otherwise I have presented that and that is what I'm asking um, and recommending for you to approve with an implementation date of the uh, election in November. Um, and these, um, this hybrid would be you know, certified and, and yes, the yes, and is, is, yes, they are certified uh, and they are something we can purchase now. Do you want to talk a little bit about the mix? Sure, absolutely. So what we did is, uh, so in the system, uh, the tabulation is done by a precinct scanner. So uh, you can either put the printed paper ballot through the scanner to be counted, or if you use a ballot marking device, there is a paper that goes in through that uh, ballot marking device and then comes back out with your selections on it, and then that would be counted through the scanner. So everything, all of the, the tabulation is done through a scanner. The mix that we're talking about, uh, obviously we would have paper ballots at every location, so if an individual chooses to vote on a paper, uh, ballot, they'll be able to do that. The mix that we use is basically what we did is we looked at what the machine counts are now currently at every uh, precinct uh, with the uh, Ivotronics we have now. And any precinct that had four or less Ivotronics would get one ballot marking device. Any precinct that had five or six uh, Ivotronics now would get two. And uh, anybody that had seven or more, which seven is going to be the maximum now with the redistricting if that goes through, uh, would have three. So that would give us a total of 92 ballot marking devices in the field, and then I would have six for our voters that would be able to replace anything or add if needed, and then two that we could use for demo purposes. So that would be 100 uh, ballot marking devices that we would purchase. And the remainder would be the, uh, those would be the ballot marking devices that then the remaining method would be the, the, the marking of the paper ballot. Correct. And I think it's important to mention that these ballot marking devices also serve as the ADA compliant Absolutely. Uh, machine, which every precinct is required to have. So yes. we would have been, originally would have been purchasing one of these for each precinct, Correct. regardless yes. of the hybrid mix. The those, hybrid just those the clarification I wanted to make. When you said if there are four, there would be one. Yes. That one would also be, it's yes. not an additional one, it's that, it, that was still the ADA. Correct. Required. Okay. We would have been required to have one at every precinct uh, for ADA purposes anyway. Okay. Yes. 
Um, I have three points. Okay. And the first one is that clear ballot could not um, provide a hybrid system for us. Is that correct? There was something not approved. Well, first of all, uh, clear ballot has not been certified. But um, in talks with them, yes, their, their ballot marking device is strictly, like, the way they have it set up is used for those that need it for ADA purposes. Uh, they don't design their product to uh, be able to be used by anyone as a ballot marking device. It's a slower process, you have to have a separate printer, uh, it actually prints out a complete ballot. Um, and so, in theory, you could use it that way, but it would not be an efficient way to use it. It's not made for that purpose, as opposed to what the, the vendor I'm recommending. They have theirs is ADA, but it's also something that they also market can be used efficiently as a ballot marking device for anyone to use. Thank you. I, I think that's an important thing for people to be able to hear who were clear ballot fans, that they're not certified right. and it's not set up to do what we're proposing to have done. Number two is that with the hybrid system, anybody who really loves voting on those machines can still vote on the machines. The difference is it will print the ballot for you to review and then drop it into the box behind it, as was done at the demonstration. And it also satisfies those people who are demanding to be able to use their hand to fill in the ballot Absolutely. and just run it through the scanner. I think that puts it in terms that maybe the average person can understand, having not been at all these seminars, to know what what you're talking about when you say ballot marking device. That's Absolutely. the machine similar to what they use now. Yes. Yeah, so uh, and one of the things that I do think that's important to note is that we did listen to those that filled out the surveys at the, at the demos that we did because I will tell you I was very much a paper ballot person to begin with and, and one of the things that we did hear from the individuals that came to the demo is they do like the, the ballot marking devices or the machines that would help them cast their vote. So that's something that I felt that was important as we looked at this and, and why you know, I, I'm here with this compromise in a way of uh, the ballot marking devices to allow those that are comfortable with the machine. But now with these new machines, they have a paper trail, a voter verified paper trail that you do put you know, that piece of paper in it. Uh, the, thing that, the thing to make sure that you remember though is that machine does not now count your vote. All it does is mark exactly how you're and what you're putting on the machine. You're still going to have to walk over and put it in a scanner for it to be counted. Okay, so that's the difference between what happened over there. We'll still be scanning it by hand then. You will be scanned. It'll be scanned through a an optical scanner that will be at the precinct. That's okay. correct. Into a ballot box. In other words, every voter will have in their hand their ballot between the time it's either marked by hand or marked by the device, and where they take it to the scanner and. And personally, so there will be one final it. count, then we will not have it be a, having to add it from two different. No. Okay. Be one. Yeah. The only the only time that would be changing would be is if we find as we go into the system that we one at certain scanner. precincts we need to have more than one scanner. Okay. And reason why I want to be purchased more than just the the sixty precincts so that we have the ability to add a scanner later, but that there is a way for those numbers to be included together. Okay. So it's not like it's going to be se ever separate. We're going to be able to get those. Okay. This well, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Mm -hmm. And then my third point is that um, by doing this, we're also limiting the cost of printing because we are getting an approval through the state. It's verbal at this point that they've met all their other uh, promises in writing. And so the third point would be that this we have the ability to do printing on demand versus having to pre-print huge amounts of ballots at a minimum for precincts where a lot of people don't turn out to begin with and it's a lot of money and storage and lifting and that sort of thing. Absolutely. So uh, as you alluded to, we, we did talk to the Department of State and uh, with the mix of having ballot marking devices and having, and I'm asking for ballot on demand to be purchased, uh, we'll be able to uh, reduce the number of pre-printed pallets that we'll have to send to the precincts um, and we'll have the ability if we ever do run low on a pre-printed ballot we'll be able to print it here at the central office and have our rovers run them out to the precincts if we ever need to do that but obviously the voter will have the choice to like as Jamie said to be able to print or to actually have a paper ballot they fill out or use a machine that would help them mark that ballot as well. And, and just kind of on your point, and I think it's important to say this, is that I very much plan to do outreach, public outreach, uh, 
scheduled demos, uh, if this is approved, to, to, to make sure the public completely understands before we ever use it, this is the system that's going to be in place. Um, and so, you know, maybe even doing that at the Expo Center, maybe going to different places in the county office, yeah, having it set up here so that we do as much public awareness as absolutely possible so that anybody that wants to see this before they actually walk into a precinct when it's an implemented will absolutely be able to see that. A booth at the 4-H Fair and one at the uh, Senior Expo I think would be mm -hmm. great because there's lots of people come to both of those. And just for the record, uh, did you have a question? Just, okay. Uh, just uh, would just general comment on the, the overall cost now and, and in relationship to what we could have spent or whatever. You know, just to let folks know that we're making the best decision not only for the equipment but also uh, guarding the uh, taxpayers' money as well. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we had budgeted, I believe, it's $1.7 million for this capital project. Um, you know, roughly, and this is, I haven't got, you know, the final figures, you know, we'll get that as we try to, to go into a contract negotiations, but roughly $711,000 for the system that I'm recommending. And then what I did also for you is just some of the things that, that I believe will need to be purchased uh, going to this system since it's a little bit different than what we have now, which would include voting booths and uh, ballot bags and boxes. Um, and uh, training that I believe that will need to be done, mandatory training for all of our poll workers just to learn the system. This would be outside of the training I do before each election. So I included that as well, which comes to a little bit less than $100,000 on, on additional things that I think that needs to be purchased. So you're looking somewhere about you know $820,000 uh, investment in, in this type of system, but it's far less than the $1.7 million that we had originally looked at as a number. In the capital. And, and remember, there is some state reimbursement coming at this point yeah. um, that, that may increase. I know there's some bills pending to increase that. There's some proposals. Um, if, if, as he mentioned, you know, we're about um, 711,000 for machines, then if you add the warranty uh, and, yes. and maintenance and so on to that, it comes to 768, plus then the add ons of, uh, you know, privacy dividers, ballot boxes, and so on. We're about 860,000. Is it 113,000 at this point? The state is uh, it's, it's passing through to us. Oh, 141,000. 141. We'll get from that. That we know. Federal money. That is the that is the federal and the slight state match that the that they had to. So we know we're getting the 141,000. Okay. And in the governor's budget, is there is. Well, yeah, the governor has proposed that nothing has been obviously passed that uh, you know the states receive. Um, they're hoping for at least 50 percent. Uh, funding, obviously, that will have to go through that process, but it is the governor's budget. Pardon me? <laughs> take the under on that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. as you as you sit here today, I think if you back out that state reimbursement plus everything that, that Michael's put in front of you, you're at a net cost right now about $720,000, which is a million less than you budgeted based on information we had, you know, back then. So and that you're can welcome. only get better. <laughs> Um, and, and that's still pending negotiations. I mean, these, these these numbers can get better as as more counties make their decisions. The pricing may improve. One of the things that I have talked to the vendor just a little bit, uh, even yesterday after Jamie and I talked, was that one of the things that, that in our final final proposal that I'm working on is is that are their best number they can give us, plus adding the fact that if we do go with them, that they will dispose of our equipment that we have now. So. It's kind of like a buyback in a way because they're giving their giving us the best price, knowing that we're going with them. But then also they will dispose of the 270 plus cybertronics and and uh, um, the, uh, stands that we have now in our warehouse because obviously that was what we be moved out for anything new coming in. So so that's something we want to keep. In the mind. stands are not adaptable to the no. current machines. No. Um, and honestly, they are very heavy and very not user friendly. Okay. I'm not a fan of right. those. Um, uh, the polling booths that I have priced, uh, they're they're really neat and, and slick and have lights, and I think they'll be really nice for our our uh, voters. And the rollout of this. Um we approve it today. What, what do you see? The first so time? obviously we'll go into contract negotiations. Uh, so there's there's a couple different ways that that can pursue. Um, obviously we can have them work with our solicitor on a contract uh, and you know have that ironed out and um, I get the final approval on that. Um, 
or we can wait for co-stars. Um, I can tell you co-star pricing isn't as good as what we're going to get if we, we negotiate directly with them and with the fact that we, there's other vendors now, all over, other counties also, you know, buying at the same time. Um, so um, my recommendation would be, would be that we start right away on, on getting things down in, in writing and look at a contract and get signatures on that once everybody agrees and we have all the legal I'm sorry, you yeah. misunderstood my question. Okay, I'm sorry. When do you see this being first implemented in the first election that these would be used? Oh, November. So the, this this so coming. The public is aware that. that yes, absolutely. Rate. So so the so the, the November election. So we would so in the primary we'd be using the Ivotronics one last time, and then we would we would go through implementation this summer, um, and um, you know have that input implemented and ready for November. Yeah, I would like one election before we get to a presidential year. Yes. Any other questions or I do have one thing I, I think we probably do need to, to make a decision on besides maybe uh, should I, I don't know like, like the, the warranty part I mean, should I get the vote first on that or ask uh, them if they want to yeah let's get let's get the other let's get the majors out of the okay. way so so you need action today on a vendor uh, system which you can recite which sure. these systems are uh, Approving, and at this point it can be the approximate cost of, uh, of the of the whole package, pending some price negotiation, and also cover then the uh, the implementation of the November uh, rollout. In, uh, and as long as you encapsulate all of that into your action as an election board, I think you've met the obligation. Then the election board uh, was the one that made this decision, so that if if you are um, you know. Um, Substituted on the election board by the court, then this this has been done. Yes. So vendor system, approximate cost, and implementation. You want to you want to recite those? Maybe make it a little easier. Sure. sure. So vendor we E S and S, election systems uh, and software, uh, and the the system would be the I call what which is a hybrid system. So it would be a combination of pre-printed paper ballots and ballot marking devices. Um, and the implementation for the November 2019 election. Oh, approximate cost, excuse me. Uh, so I have um, roughly $711,000 for the purchase of the uh, actual system, um, plus then the warranty cost of somewhere around $41,000 annually. Um, don't include the yeah, I would include those. Okay. Yeah. Or, and then also there is the option of an extended warranty, uh, which basically means they would come here and um, do any of the um, maintenance that we would need, uh, repairs here, and uh, they would also come every two years to do basically uh, maintenance on these machines. That cost would be roughly um, about sixteen thousand five hundred dollars. That's year. part of your recommendation, and that I I do believe that that is the best way to do that. Um, that's what we have now. It, we'll just kind of move it back a little bit from yearly to um, every two years because so I don't think we probably need something yearly with new equipment. But I I do believe it it would be our best interest to have someone come in and look at that um, every two years. And then if you don't use the if you don't buy the extended, you basically have to pay to send it out if something breaks, and then they would. They would fix it in Omaha and then send it back to us. So you would have that time delay, um, which would be fine. It's just it's just a, a little nicety if we can have it um, along with the maintenance itself. They would come here. We could and we could ask questions while they're here, get them fixed. No, I, I'd like to comment. Okay, do we motion to forward? Yeah, let's let's get the motion on the board at this point. We move to approve what uh, Mike has outlined for us. I'll second the motion, but I do have s several comments. I've been trying to get your attention for a little while, so I apologize for not succeeding. Uh, but first of all, there's a question from a um, someone watching live, a constituent, mm -hmm. and they are asking, and I know the answer, but if you can succinctly sure. answer, will this eliminate poll workers? Oh, absolutely not. No, the, the jobs of poll workers will change, hence the reason why I'm asking for the mandatory training to learn the system, because they'll have to learn the system first before we even can put in new procedures for them exactly how they would do that. But no, we will still absolutely want, and we'll encourage anybody that wants to be a poll worker to please contact my office. Okay. And then the second one is I would like to um, 
support you in your effort to negotiate directly with the companies. Mm -hmm. CCAP uh, did encourage at the board meetings that even if CoStars comes out with the price, don't stop there. Continue to negotiate by pooling with other counties to get a better price, by negotiating directly with the companies. You're doing the right thing on that. And number three, I just want to say thank you for all of your efforts and time. Not only uh, have you been working on this voting machine issue, but you have been working on uh, the new precincts where we had had people had too large uh, because there was lines at the polls on in presidential elections, and you have just uh, taken on a, a humongous task and also worked with our state senator uh, Mike Fulmer in order to bring reform to the voting system, uh, which is sorely needed. There are a lot of antiquated things. The election law hasn't been looked at for like 70 years. Right. And you appeared in Harrisburg. So you have been in the forefront. You have the respect of Kathy Bookwar, the Department of State. And I just think you need to know how proud we are that you are representing Lebanon County and have done the stellar job, the, the yeoman's job, that you have taken on this year. It's way above and beyond uh, what we ever anticipated, having had this mandate come down upon us. Thank well, you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And my pleasure. Uh, so, basically, and that's why I didn't uh, pay any attention to Commissioner Litz when she wanted my attention, because she got to say everything that I intended to say. <laughs> Uh, I would uh, just like to say, as serving as uh, chair of the Board of Elections, I have worked closely with Michael, and uh, it's, a, it's a difficult position to be in when things, little things arise at, at, at the uh, polling places and so on. Uh, you're always under the gun, Michael, and, and I think you've, uh, as Commissioner Litz said, you've represented us well. You've worked closely with us, and you worked through this process, involved the community, and made it possible, I think, for us to make the, the wise decision that we're making. So I, I personally want to thank you. And Commissioner Phillips, do you want to top that off? Um, whatever's left of the uh, grant, yes. Uh, but I, I would like to thank you, Bill, for working with Michael so uh, diligently and coming to this conclusion. And, also, the um, I think the hybrid solution was a good one because, you know, with the different generations that we deal with, I think this will help address all those kind of uh, uh, concerns and, and uh, interests. And I, I also think um, it will add another layer of credibility to, you know, assist the, the whole process. So I think we, we've done, you know, a good uh, good process here, and, and I thank you for all that, and Bill, thank you for chair. And it's nice when things turn out well and, and under budget yeah, and under budget too so yeah so with that said I'll uh, call all those in favor of the motion that's on the floor indicate by saying aye aye, aye. aye. opposed so ordered okay uh jamie should i have them vote on the the, the extra because i didn't go over that in that proposal or is that something i i i treated it as all you, you, the whole recommendation. you mentioned the, okay. the, okay. the warranty of work and okay so, so my last thing that i would like to just kind of get a feel of what the board's feeling on this um obviously at the beginning we talked a little bit about electronic poll books um i am not making recommendation for any purchase of electronic poll books at this time I, and the reason for that is because I don't feel that we, or, or me specifically, but even the board has had the opportunity to, to research um, different vendors, their products, um, what they offer, security. Um, there's a whole set of different things I believe that need to be addressed when we talk about electronic pull books and if that's the way that we want to go. Uh, basically what I'm asking for the board's vote today is just, is that something that we would still like to pursue? I'm more than happy to, 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 to spear that and to bring vendors in that are certified, um, talk to them about the safety of, those, of that method. Um, I can tell you we did get some positive reviews from um, the public at the, the demo about electronic poll books. Um, so it's not something I, I, I'm asking for to be you know, a certain date or, or, a, or a vendor or a selection, but just is it something that if the board believes it's, that I should pursue or should I just kind of leave that, you know, stay in this point. Michael, uh, do you have any feedback? The public is one thing, but how about the poll workers? Absolutely love them. Okay, that was easy. Yes. Okay. 
So if you'd like a, a motion, uh, you know, we can, what? I, I would like to comment first. Well, I, I never, I never uh, prevent you from commenting, Commissioner, do I? Absolutely. I, I, you, you know, you certainly should be able to comment. Go ahead. Thank you. Michael, um, you know, I had an article that recommended against the poll books. And after viewing them at the expo and other places, and also experiencing things with iPhones and iPads, which is essentially what these are, in my humble opinion, this is the vulnerability, the weak spot in our voting systems if we get these, because they contain personal information of all of our voters in Lebanon County. If you have an iPhone, you can do airdrops, and people can hack into your um, things using hotspots and whatever. I, you are not safe with your computer. When it's turned on, they can hack in. And for this reason, I highly recommend going after these poll books. I think that it would be a mistake. I, I completely agree with the proposal that we, we went through today on the voting machines, but I have to draw the line for myself when it comes to these poll books. They, we're trying to improve so we don't have voter fraud. This would be the weak spot that would allow voter fraud. I just, and also personal identity theft, I, I just can't support that. I uh, certainly uh, appreciate your, your feelings and your comments on that. Uh, actually, we already have the greatest vulnerability for voter fraud, and that is that we do not require ID, for personal ID for people to vote. And hopefully someday we'll be courageous enough to address that at a state level or a national level. On the other hand, uh, I think that we do not want to, at this point in time, curtail at least the possibility of looking at poll, uh, electronic poll books and getting good demonstrations and representations and a professional view on vulnerability and those kinds of things. So I. If I can get a motion to just move forward and let, let Michael at least bring folks in to demonstrate these and so on, I would take that additional statement. I'll, I'll so move. Do I have a second? Yes, sir. All right. Well, I'm willing to make the second. So uh, a motion and a second on the floor to at least uh, allow Michael to move forward with exploring. Stop. Exploring. So Transparency. all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion passes, Michael, two to one. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for all of you and for your support of my office. And in this process, uh, I know it's not easy, a lot of information, a lot of emails back and forth. So I just wanted to say thank you uh, for making this, pro this process, even though it was long, um, much, smooth. much easier, smooth, much smoother than it has been in a lot of other counties. And, you know, and I don't mean to keep holding your time, but I also think it's very important the public understands that this, one of the reasons why this process was smooth for our county was because of the fine job that you've done as commissioners to put us in a, in a financial uh, situation where we were just not dependent on an outside source to come in here and bail us out it, it, when we need this. You have all three have done an excellent job of putting us in a place where we, I never had to worry. Yes, money is an issue, and yes, we need to make sure that we're doing our due diligence, but it wasn't in a place where we could not do anything because this county was not financially able to do anything. So thank you for that, for the many years of, the, of your hard work in getting this county in the financial situation. For you. So thank you for that. Thank you. I'd just like to address the um, identity um, that you talked about. Oops. And... Uh, First of all, we have three forms of required identity when someone walks into the poll. Some are obvious. Uh, one is facial recognition, one is voice res recognition, and the other is a signature. I have been a notary public for hmm, close to 50 years. The time I started and the law today remain the same. If I can personally verify someone, you do not need additional ID. That is the law. And to change it, 
when you have something that you're producing, a computer can replicate that. And with all of that being said, I think we have the most dependable and reliable forms of ID possible, things that people can't duplicate, pe things that people can't steal from you. And uh, I'm very happy with the forms of ID that we are currently using. It's very scientific as well, I might add. You're relying on poll workers to recognize literally for thousands of people what they People in their neighborhood, neighborhood who, say, who they see, the post office, the bank, the grocery store, on the street, raking leaves, these are their friends and neighbors. All right, we're, we're finished with that discussion. Do you like to a motion to adjourn? I would like a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Okay. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> that uh, concludes our formal agenda. Back to the regular meeting. I've got a number of items for you. Um, first is uh, an application for hotel tax grant funding. Uh, we received an application from the Caring Cupboard uh, of Palmyra, and they are requesting a $5,000 grant toward the Truck Trek Food Truck and Arts Festival of Central Pennsylvania to be held May 11th. Uh, they have a total project cost of $15,000 and would like $5,000 toward that. They're celebrating their fifth year of success in 2019. Each year, Truck Trek brings 5,000 to 8,000 people together on Cherry Street in Palmyra for a festival. Uh, about uh, 10 to 15 food trucks, about 30 local arts and business vendors. And this event was originally organized by the Palmyra Area Business Association in 2018. They partnered with the Caring Cupboard. And um, as a result of that, we were, have donated $2,000 in proceeds back to the Caring Cupboard. And in 2019, they would like to improve their marketing and expand it into neighboring towns within a 10 mile radius of Kawaira, which obviously would include um, tourism outside of the county, going over the county line to the west. So uh, they're requesting a $5,000 grant. I'll make a motion to approve the door Second. Door. It's been moved and second that we approve the request by the Karen Covert. Any question or comment? If not, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 same sign is so moved. Okay, uh, I have a proclamation for your approval for the Boy Scout Expo um, to, uh, that was, is, as we speak, being held, I believe, at the, on the Valley Mall. And uh, this is a, recognizing the, the longevity of the Scouts in uh, February of 1910. And um, the Pennsylvania Dutch Council chartered in 1971. And the uh, fact that the Horseshoe Trail District of Pennsylvania Dutch Council consists of more than 90 scouting units and more than 2,100 youth annually uh, in the area with over 900 volunteers and their Boy Scout Week is February 4th through the 8th, 2019 for the Boy Scout Expo last year for one. Motion. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further questions or comment? Not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Post same sign, so uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, I have uh, appointments to the Capital Resource Conservation and Development Council, um, whose uh, we have terms who are expiring with need reappointment. They are Randy Leisure, who is the Conservation District Representative. His term would go to March of 2022. Uh, Julie Cheney, who is the representative on behalf of the County Commissioners to the Development Council term would go to March 31st of 2020, and Emily Collins, uh, who would be a member at large and whose term would go to March 31st of 2021. Second motion. I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we make those appointments. Any questions? Not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Same sign, so we have uh, two Applications for County Liquid Fuels Funds for Palmyra Borough for um, paving on Horstick Avenue at a total estimated cost for project of $266,000. Their allocation would be $7,320 for 2019. And uh, in the City of Lebanon, they are intending to use their 2019 allocation for paving and general maintenance in the amount of $25,000. 
I'll make a motion to approve Palmyra and the City of Lebanon liquid fuel requests. Second. Let's move and second. Any comment? Not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign, so moved. Okay. I have a uh, disabled veteran exemption request from uh, a real property tax. And they are Kenneth Dunk of Knoll Oak, Knoll Circle, Lebanon. Matthew Mullaney of Barnside Drive, Palmyra, and Lynn Alexander of Swissar Circle, Jonestown, all three of whom have met, of whom have met the uh, requirements for the exemption. I'll make a motion to approve the exemption for the three uh, disabled veterans as listed. Second. We have a motion to a second. Any question or comment? Hearing no all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, so moved. And the last thing is uh, not needing any action on this at this point, but just to remind you and inform you, I know you've had an opportunity to review it, but uh, Warden Carnes at the prison will be sending out a request, a request for proposals for uh, medical services at the prison with a planned uh, calorie, I guess, schedule of the RFPs going out uh, tomorrow, um, entertaining any tools and questions for the next couple of weeks, seeking um, deadline for RFPs in early March and hopefully have a new decision uh, on that by the end of March. So wow. we'll make you aware of that when we have the meeting. Okay. And that's a secret motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Adjourn. Thank you.